Well, good afternoon. Trust everyone is well and um, excited about being in God's house. What a wonderful opportunity God has given us to be together here tonight. Let me uh, just say happy birthday to Miss Lois and uh, bless you. And uh, we're just excited about uh, your birthday and you being with us in these days. I wonder before we uh, look at a portion of God's Word, and we're going to look at Psalm chapter 7 tonight, the seventh Psalm, if there are prayer requests that you would like to share with us, people who are on your heart that we need to be praying for, or situations that we need to be praying for as well this evening. Technical difficulty, excuse me. Is that better, Kenny? Okay. Okay. Debbie McMahon had surgery today, and uh, so we'll be praying for her. Thank you, Brother Larry. Something else. Others on your heart this afternoon. Okay. Okay. What's the date in August? Twentieth. Okay. So Brother Larry's uh, trip was canceled postponed uh, until August 20th to Cuba. So we'll certainly be praying for you uh, as you prepare to go and for uh, them there that uh, as we pray for them and um, you prepare to go that uh, God would place on our hearts uh, those needs that are there and that we might uh, meet those needs tangibly that need to be met. Is the situation any better there, Brother Larry? We're about the same as we were last time we talked about that. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, we certainly need to be praying for those churches in Cuba, the leaders of those churches in Cuba, and all of those church members who are Uh, being affected by this, being unable to get food. Wow. (laughs) Wow, okay. Uh, We'll certainly pray for Brother Fifi and for those churches there as well in the midst of these days. Of difficulty. It's hard for us, Brother Larry, to get our head around that, you know, because we don't we don't deal with that kind of thing here. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? Well, we certainly be praying for them. Let me encourage you to to add uh, those churches in Cuba and those pastors in Cuba to your. Uh, Prayer list. I know you have prayer list. Uh, you might want to put that on your uh, refrigerator door. So every time you go to your, your refrigerator, you might be reminded, prompted to pray for them there in that place. Their needs there. Something else on your heart. Well, let's pray together this afternoon. Brother Marty, would you? Uh, Lead us to the throne of grace tonight, my brother. 
thank you, my dear brother. Let me uh, share with you by way of introduction as we move our way into looking at uh, Psalm number 7 that um, the uh, New King James Version of Scripture puts in the title for this particular psalm, Prayer and Praise for Deliverance from Enemies. And then the subtitle under that, A Meditation of David which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. And so we know nothing about Cush, a Benjamite, but that which we see here in the context of the seventh psalm. Most scholars would say to us that uh, the situation in David's life was as he was writing the seventh psalm found in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and then additional information in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And so you would understand that in 1 Samuel chapter 20 that the Word of God declares to us that dynamic positive relationship that David had with Jonathan. And so we see in the context of that, that that Jonathan is in the throne area of King Saul, and that he has access unto Saul and unto his leadership team. And so Jonathan is receiving information from those leaders and taking that information back to David, who is his best friend, so that he might keep in any way possible David safe from harm that might be coming his way. And so before we look together at this psalm, and I talk about some personal things for me as found in the context of this psalm, let me take you back to 1 Samuel chapter 20. I want to read a couple of verses there in 1 Samuel 20 and then read some verses in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and just set the context for that which we're going to see in Psalm 7. And I would say to you that, um, that scholars are using similar language, if you will, within the context of 1 Samuel 20, and then again in 1 Samuel chapter 24, and then comparing that language in the Hebrew with that which chapter 7, or the 7th Psalm. And so what the majority of those Hebrew scholars have discovered is that within the context of Psalm 7, David is fleeing from Saul, and he recognizes that Saul is seeking to kill him. That we know that even when David was in the court of King Saul, that on three separate occasions Saul threw spears at David. And there's a great book that was written a number of years ago called A Tale of Three Kings. And um, if you've not seen it, I would encourage you to, to locate it and read it. It is a great, great read. And it talks about <coughs> excuse me, David dealing with Saul, and then David having to deal with Absalom as well. And so it's just a fascinating read as it relates to that. And then obviously it goes into Solomon as well. But let me draw your attention to... 1 Samuel chapter 20, and I want to read the first three verses to us so you can begin in your mind's eye to set the stage for that which we're looking at. Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life. So Jonathan said unto him, By no means, you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? 
it is not so. Then David took an oath again and said, Your father, the king, King Saul, certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 20, we begin to see this picture in the life of King David that Saul is actively pursuing him, seeking to take his life. Now why would Saul do that? What was Saul's big beef with David? What we know is that the children of Israel sang a song that says, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And so Saul was jealous of David. And that as long as David was around, David he perceived that David was going to be a thorn in his side. That David was going to hinder his ability to be the king that Saul thought he ought to be. And so we see here in chapter 20 that David was just one step, as he says there in verse 3, just one step away from being put to death by Saul and the army of men that Saul had sent to take care of David. Now it's fascinating to know, and turn over to to chapter 24, and um, I find it fascinating within the context of David's encounters with Saul. And in chapter 24 we see uh, David encountering Saul, that uh, David had ample opportunity to kill King Saul. And yet because he recognized that Saul was God's anointed king over the united kingdom of Israel, that he was not interested, even if his own life was in danger, he was not interested in taking King Saul's life. So let me read the first eight or nine, maybe ten verses of chapter 24, so that you can see how that played out. Now it happened, when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Now En Gedi is located just adjacent to the Dead Sea, and that there is a great spring located at En Gedi as well. And in fact, on both of our trips to Israel, uh, we were able to stop there at that spring at En Gedi. And it is a gorgeous, beautiful place, uh, a very solemn place, but but a beautiful place where there's water, sweet water, coming up out of the ground. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfold by the road, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his knees. Need, excuse me. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is, in the present tense, the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. 
And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward, went out to the out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eyes spared you and said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your road, robe, I did not kill you. Know and see that there is ne- neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, wickedness proceeds from the wicked. Now it's interesting that um, the author of the book of 1 Samuel here in chapter 24, uses that term, the the wickedness of the wicked. Because in the context, and in the actual text of of chapter 7, Psalm 7, we find those very words within this psalm. And so we recognize, and I think it's plausible for us to say, that David was dealing with Saul and dealing with Saul's not just 3,000 men, but the Word of God declares unto us that there were 3,000 chosen men, 3,000 men of great valor, 3,000 men who were bent on David's destruction. Odds aren't very good there, are they? 3,000 to 1? Maybe 3,000 to 2. And with God on David's side, I think he was going to survive that. But what we see here is that there was an active uh, participation in the life of Saul and these 3,000 men to destroy King David. So when I came to this psalm and I began to read this psalm, there was something that stuck out to me personally as we moved into verse 1. So let me read verse 1 to you, and then I'll tell you what the Lord began to share with me about this. Look at, look at what verse 1 says of Psalm 7. O Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me. And so as I read that and began to think about what that verse said, the Lord took me to that last phrase in that verse 1, and deliver me. So as I begin to think about David seeking deliverance from God, and you would recognize within the context of the Old Testament, in the context of the Hebrew Bible, that salvation literally was deliverance. So the word Salvation in Hebrew literally means deliverance. And so I begin to think about God being the author of deliverance. And so we go all the way back to Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 3 we discover that Adam and Eve had been given instruction. In fact, they were given a prescription by God about how they were to act and respond. Eve was deceived and she turned and gave, after having eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she turned and gave to her husband Adam and he ate as well. And we know that God came looking for them in the cool of the day and 
and they were nowhere to be found because they recognized after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were naked and they were afraid to be in the presence of Almighty God. And so God was hunting for Adam and Eve in the wilderness, or excuse me, in the garden. And that um, when he found them, he asked them about eating of the tree. And that God then banished them from the Garden of Eden. And within the context of that banishment, God cursed the ground that Adam and Eve walked on. There was a curse given to Adam and a curse given to Eve as well. And then the Bible tells us that God killed an animal and the word for covering there in Genesis chapter 3 is a word that means animal skin. And so within the context of the Hebrew, and we don't get that in the English language, what we discover is in, in Genesis 3 is that God killed an animal so that Adam and Eve could be covered when they were in the presence of Almighty God. And so, after sin comes into the picture in Genesis chapter 3, immediately following that, and we have that great prototypical evangelistic um, piece given us in Genesis 3.15, we discover that God provides coverings for Adam and Eve. And He literally delivered them in that sense. Then as we move forward in the, in the context of, of, of Genesis, and I'm not going to talk about all of Genesis, and I could, and I could talk about all of the Old Testament and, and show you time after time after time after time where God delivered the children of Israel. What we discover is that Cain and Abel were coming to bring sacrifice, coming to bring their offering to God. And those boys knew because mom and dad had told them about God taking care of them. And they knew about the curse on the land and the curse on man and the curse on woman. And so we, we know that, uh, that Abel brought his best. Brought the best of his flock. And that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and that Cain killed Abel because his sacrifice was not acceptable unto God. And so the enemy thought that the line that the Messiah was going to come through had been broken and that God raised up out of the body of Adam and Eve, Seth, who was to be in the line of Jesus Christ, the Deliverer. We find God delivering Noah and his family in the midst of the flood. Now, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand that story very well. Uh, obviously, I'd seen pictures it, it, growing up in Sunday school and all those kinds of things. But, but what amazed me when we finally went to the Holy Land in our first... Apparently what Noah did was he built a boat in the middle of the desert. Something implausible about that. We know that for over a hundred years that people came to him to see this great spectacle that he was making and that he preached God to them in that context. And we know that God delivered Noah and his family. He saved them through the flood. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, talks about Noah and his family being saved through the flood. And on and on and on we could go, thinking about God being the great deliverer. And we see here at the beginning of Psalm 7 that we find the same turn for God that we saw in Psalm 6. Do we not? You see what the first phrase is? 
O Lord my God, and we're talking there again about the covenant name of God, Yahweh and Jehovah, in, in this word Lord in capital letters. Interesting to note that the, that the term Lord is found seven times, and seven is the number of completion. It's found seven times in Psalm 7. And so we find it in verse 1, we find it in verse 3, we find it in verse 6, we find it two times in verse 8, we find it two times in verse 17. So seven times the word Lord, L-O-R-D, is found in this psalm. Then we find this word God as well. And it is the Hebrew word Elohim. And the word Elohim really means God Almighty. Or speaks to us about the Almighty God, the captain of the host, if you will, the one who is in charge of all things. And so we understand here, recognizing that six times David uses this word Elohim to remind us not only in the context of God being our Lord, that is to say that we have a covenantal relationship with God through Christ under the new covenant, and within the context of the old covenant, that the children of Israel were part of that covenant family as well. And David says, O oh Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Now we live in a world where people trust all sorts of things. That They trust things that are not trustworthy. And that even within the context of the body of Christ, we're not always placing our faith and our trust in God. Because all of us have egos. And all of us have a tendency to want to do it ourselves and do it our way. And yet within this psalm, we see David making the declaration at the beginning of it that he is putting his trust. And you would recognize that trust is coupled together with faith and that trust is a result of having faith in. So David is declaring to us here in verse 1 that he has put his trust in the Lord God, in the God of covenant, in God Almighty, and that that trust is based upon his having faith in God and his faith has been developed over the time of his life because he grew up in a Hebrew home. <laughs> and in the context of that Hebrew home, he would have been told those glorious Old Testament stories. And so he would have learned of all those things that the covenant God had done for the children of Israel. And now in the midst of this situation, as David is a young man fleeing for his life from Saul the king, and he is declaring that he is placing his trust in God. And so within the context here of verse 1, notice what he does. He makes that declaration here at the beginning of verse 1, and then as we move our way in to verse 1, the second primary thing that he says to God is, Save me. And the reason that he is looking to God with whom he has trust in to be saved is because his enemies are persecuting him. And that he wants to be sure that those who are persecuting him, that he is being saved from them. So you notice he says, save me and deliver me. Now it's interesting that these are two distinctly different words in Hebrew. 
and that within the context of the word save me, we discover that he is declaring to us that he is looking for this physical dealing with those who are persecuting him and that he is physically saved from them. And then he talks about being delivered by God because he recognizes, look at verse 2, and look at what verse 2 says, lest they, talking about Saul, talking about those 3,000 soldiers, they, he lumps Saul in with that group, they tear me like a lion. So when someone was attacked by a lion in the Middle East, 3,000 years ago, there was very little that could happen to save them from being literally torn into pieces. So obviously, David recognizes from what he's saying here in verse 2 that it has an impact on what he said over in 1 Samuel 20 as well that he was only one step away from death, and that he realized that Saul and his army of 3,000 could just as easily as not bring death to him. And so look what he says, lest they tear me. So, Lord, I put my trust in you, Save me from those who persecute me and deliver me. Lest, so if you don't save me, if you don't deliver me, then they will tear me to pieces like a lion would tear prey or tear that which they're going after into pieces as well. Rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver me. So he recognizes, David recognizes the gravity of the situation he finds himself in. And yet he does what we all should do in the midst of whatever situations we find ourselves in. That he declared at the beginning of this psalm that his faith and trust were in Almighty God and that he was beginning from that place to move forward in faith to do what God would have him to do. So in this psalm, there are a couple of things that we learn. First of all, we learn that God's people are often slandered. And certainly within the context of the world in which we live, there are those round about us because they're uh, walking according to the will and the way of the enemy that they want nothing more than but to slander the church of the living God and the people who comprise that body. And so we live in a world of slander. And that false accusations, and what we'll discover as we work our way through this psalm is that Saul and his 3,000 chosen ones were making false accusations against David. And that was reflected as well in what David said to Saul after he bowed before him as the king and then handed back to him the corner of his garment that he was able to take from him while he was there in that cave. And that what we can learn here is that such an event in your life or mine will end poorly in most cases if we don't begin that with Almighty God. Because God will assuredly judge the wicked and that He will surely vindicate the righteous. And so what we discover in the context of the Old Testament is that the children of Israel were constantly wondering, and we even see within the lives of the apostles, 
that they wondered as well, when was God going to bring about that judgment on those people who had done God's children wrong? And so as we work our way and read through this psalm, we will discover that God will provide and that God does take care of the righteous and that God will bring wrath to those who are wicked. And then we discover that the law of retribution, which is the law of God, works. We see that in the context of this passage. And then what we discover is found at the end of the ver at the end of the psalm because in verse 17 it declares to us that no matter what happened that David recognized he was going to sing praise to God and what you and I can learn from that as well is that no matter how grim or dark the situation may be, that we have hope in Christ and hope in God and that we should continue to praise Him because He is worthy of all praise. Let me read this psalm to us and then I'll give you just a very quick and easy outline and then, given the amount of time that we have left, I'll point some things out within the context of this passage. Let me read this psalm to us. O Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me, and deliver me, lest they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces, while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, second time we find that in this passage. And then we notice that he begins several conditional passages here. If, he uses the term if, which would indicate to us that it's a conditional situation. If I have done this, if there is iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him who was at peace with me, or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth. So in essence, what David says is that if I am guilty of that which is being said about me by Saul and his men, then God, you let them come and take me and kill me. And then he says, and lay my honor in the dust. Now remember that David is a friend of God's. That David has a relationship with God that he declares to us in verse 1 and then again in verse 3 when he uses that term, O Lord my God. And so we understand that uh, David has a vested interest in that which God is going to do. And God has a vested interest in David because David is part of that lineage that will bring us to Christ. And that the word of God, prophetically speaking, says that the Messiah will be seated on the throne of David in the end time. But look what else it says here. And then it says Selah there. And we recognize that term Selah just means to rest, to think on these things. So, so, so David is, is encouraging us when we find ourselves in a, a, a bad situation to evaluate whether or not we are at fault, whether it's something that we have precipitated, whether it's because we have sinned and something that we've done that has caused this to come upon us. And if in fact that is the case, then repentance is what is necessary in your life and in mine. Verse 6 says, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage or the wrath of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the people shall surround you. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. 
the Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. Interesting con- context there. And according to my integrity within me. O oh, let the wickedness of the wicked. Now that's that phrase that I was talking to you about earlier that we read over there in 1 Samuel. The wickedness of the wicked. We find that verbatim in 1 Samuel. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God test the hearts and minds. My defense is of God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day if he does not turn back. That is to say that if the enemy, if the wicked does not turn back, then God, he, he will sharpen his sword. God will sharpen his sword. God bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, The wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealings shall come down on his own crown. Crown of his head. Then in then verse 17, which functions as a doxology, are a, an ending picture here. I will praise the Lord according to His righteousness. So, so the question that you and I should ask as it relates to the beginning of verse 17 is, how righteous is God? And that David declares that his praise to God is based not on his own righteousness, not on the righteousness of the people, not on the lack of righteousness on the part of the people, but he is praising God because of his righteousness, because of God's righteousness. So even when we don't feel like praising God, because God never changes, because God is absolutely and completely perfectly righteous that you and I should praise Him because of who He is so that we can give Him the glory that is due His name. So look what it says at the end of verse 17. And we'll sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. For He is our covenant God. He is the Lord Most High. So the first five verses we find David's plea for deliverance. Verses 1 through 5, David's plea for deliverance. The second primary point of of the outline is in verses 6 through 13, we find the judgment of God, the righteous judgment of God. Not just judgment, but the righteous judgment of God. Verses 6 through 13. David's plea for deliverance, verses 1 through 5. The righteous judgment of God in 6 through 13. And the resolution of the matter. The resolution of the matter in verses 14 through 17. So so notice what David says O oh Lord my God, in you I put my trust. And so he has placed himself under the protective power of Almighty God. And he is seeking to be set free from his pursuers, 
And so we've already talked basically about these first two verses. Look at verse 3. We find his protest in innocence, if you will. Oh, Lord my God, if I've done this. So he is going to God, recognizing that he does not believe that he, what he has done has been worthy of the response of Saul and his army against him. So look what David says. David appears with what he says here in these verses, that he is aware of his innocence, that he recognizes that he has done nothing that would cause this to come upon him. O oh Lord, if I have done this, if there is iniquity, if there is sin in my hands, he says, if I have repaid evil to him who was at peace with me. Or plundered, the word of God says, my enemy without cause. Now think about that in the context of what David did in 1 Samuel chapter 24. He could have killed the king just as easily as not within the context of that cave. If he cut off the corner of his robe without him knowing it, a couple of things must have been pretty dark in there. And also... Saul was not expecting David to be there, obviously. But he could, just as easily as cutting off the corner of his document, killed Saul. And yet in 1 Samuel 24, he declares that Saul is God's anointed king. Good, bad, or otherwise. And so we understand that God placed a call on Saul. And that the Word of God speaks to us about the call of God being irrevocable. And so David understood this better, quite frankly, than we would have. And so he did not see Saul so much as being his pursuer as seeing him as being God's anointed king. And so David's declaration through his acts are God will deal with Saul. I don't have to. God will take care of him. God will do what is necessary in the life of Saul. And so in essence, David is saying, I'm not God. It's not my responsibility. God didn't call me to be God. He called me to be David. And so David understood his position. And I think one of the things that you and I have to understand in life is that God has placed us in whatever position we're in with a purpose and for a purpose, which is for his kingdom's work. And so when we understand that and understand that he is in charge and that we have humbled ourselves before him, you remember the Bible says in Jesus speaking about the little children that all those who come to, to Christ must come as a little child because a child comes in trusting faith and a child comes in submission. And if we're going to be saved, and we are saved as the people of God in this place, I certainly hope so, that, that the only way we could come to God was in humility. And that in that humility, David is living out a, a desperately difficult situation in his own life. And so what we see here is 
that David goes on to declare, let mine enemies pursue me and overtake me. And let him trample my life to the earth. Literally, he's saying, let me be put to death if I am responsible for what is going on in my life right now. And so David is delineating, drawing a line, if you will, between the test of God and the trial coming from the enemy and the enemy seeking to destroy him. So we discover here that um, he recognizes that he will lay his honor in the dust if God so chooses him to do that. Then in verse 6, he speaks to God, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage or the wrath of my enemies. And then he says, Rise up for me to the judgment. He is in essence saying, God, I'm asking you, to raise yourself up in judgment against my enemies. Because you have commanded. So what had God commanded? Well, first and foremost of all, we know that God had commanded the children of Israel, certainly within the context of their coming out of Egyptian bondage, that they were to be obedient unto the will of God and the word of God. That obedience was a key. That obedience was a factor. And that they knew full well. Did they not? Didn't the children of Israel understand, according to Numbers chapter 13, that if they chose not to do the will of God, that judgment came on them. What we know is that Caleb and Joshua brought a good report from the, the land of promise. God told them to go in possess the land. And they decided for themselves, according to the report of the ten spies, that yes, it was a land of promise. Yes, it was a land of milk and honey. But we were as grasshoppers in the sight of those vast, great, armed people who were there in that place as well. And so they believed an evil report. And what we know is that the children of Israel were forced by God to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness because they had chosen by a definitive act of their wills to disobey God. And that disobedience brought judgment. Now we could go back to, to, to those things that we talked about in Genesis chapter 3 and then Cain and Abel and then in Noah. And in each of those situations, disobedience brought judgment. And so God had commanded obedience. And David recognizes that what's going on is being disobedient unto God. He is calling for God to come in His righteous judgment. So the congregation of the people shall surround you, because you have commanded. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. The Lord shall judge the peoples, plural. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. David was upright in the sight of God. The Word of God tells us that. Friend of God. Didn't mean that he was sinless. Didn't mean that he was perfect. But that he was a man after God's own heart. The Word of God declares us. And according to my integrity within me. So he is declaring to God that he's a person of integrity. Now we've talked about this idea of integrity and I shared with you in a sermon some months ago about the Titanic being the first ship with watertight integrity. 
That means that if a portion of it flooded, it wouldn't sink. But the issue with watertight integrity is that you have to utilize uh, those tools that are available to you to create that watertight environment. And that because they thought that the Titanic was unsinkable, they did not even concern themselves with dogging down those watertight doors in that vessel. And when they ran into an iceberg and ripped a 300-foot uh, hole in the side of that boat, it sank because they did not utilize that which that vessel was made with. David's talking about his integrity. He's a person of integrity. He's one who lived a life of integrity for the most part. Now, he made mistakes. We know that. But that he was a man after God's own heart. So look what it says here. Verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. So he recognizes the, the nature of what's going on here. But establish the just. So David is asking that God would establish him because he's just, because he's functioning in righteousness, because he's a person of integrity. For the righteous God tests the hearts and the minds. Then he says, my defense is of God, or my defense is comes from God. And so in verse 1 he said that he placed his trust in God, Save me, deliver me. Now here in verse 10, he says, My defense is from God. My defense is in God who saves the upright of heart. And so within the context of this psalm, one of the things that David does is he contrasts the righteous with the wicked. And so we can see that pretty readily. <coughs> Excuse me, within this psalm. Then look what he says in verse 11. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, if God is angry with the wicked every day, then every day that a wicked person lives is a day of the mercy of God being poured out on that individual. And that you and I should seek to see those outside the family of God come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Look what he says. If he does not turn back, then God is going to sharpen his sword. He's going to bend his bow and make it ready. He's going to be prepared for warfare. It's what this passage is talking about. Using this physical picture of God, but we recognize that God's spirit, but he's using this physical picture of one getting ready for battle, and he's talking about God. He makes his bow ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death, and he makes his arrows into fiery shafts. So not only has he prepared his bow, but he's prepared his arrows as well, which was the primary means of taking care of enemies 3,000 years ago. Then he says, Behold, in verse 14, the wicked bring forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch, into the pit that he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head. And you know what? Within the context of Saul, that's exactly what happened. His trouble came back to him. And certainly within the, within the context of King Solomon, for all those good things that he did, his trouble came back upon him as well. And his violent dealings shall come down on his own head, or on his own crown. Talking about the crown of the head there. The, the word in Hebrew deals with the crown of the head. So we understand that it comes back on his own head. And then finally, in verse 17, David says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name. So the name of God carries with it the character of God, right? We understand that the name of God 
talks about the character of God. The name of God talks not only about the character of God, it talks about the attributes of God. Not only does it talk about the character and the attributes of God, it talks about the actions of God as well. So David is praising the name of God, recognizing the character of God, recognizing the attributes of God, and recognizing the actions of God in accordance with those attributes in the, and in accordance with his character. And so you and I can take away from this song that God takes care of his children, that God brings deliverance for his children, that God ministers to the needs of his children. And we, much more so than even David 3,000 years ago, because under the new covenant, what happens under the new covenant? God came to dwell in us. And so we see that we are more blessed and we have more things to praise God about than even David did because God so loved us that he sent his son to be the savior of the world for all those who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for Psalm 7. We thank you for the background that you've given us in 1 Samuel 20 through 24. And that as we look at that context, we can see and understand the situation that David was in. And that you provided deliverance for him. What a mighty God you are. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for leading and guiding us. Father, I pray that we would love you with a whole heart, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And that we would love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you for teaching us how to love you. Witness us now in the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' most holy and blessed name I pray. Amen. God bless you.